what are the things that are metabolically hindering us that we have today that we did not have 100 years ago? Number one thing that I see, um, and this is fantastically summarized in an old article by Drunowski, who's a giant in this field, um, but dietary shifts. Two great hallmarks of the dietary shifts have been an increased calorie surplus and processed foods. So obviously, right, we no longer, first of all, chase the food supply. The food supply chases us. We get advertisement for it. We're inundated with images of food. We have this culture of eating three times a day. And this is not something that we are metabolically adapted to, right? Our culture and society changes at a far greater pace than our biology is able to mutate, be selectively chosen for, and adapt through generations. So the average caloric intake, first of all, is again, increased significantly due to the abundance of food in general, but also high energy dense food that unfortunately, when you look at the energy density of food and the nutritional quality, they're inversely associated. So as, a, as something like, you know, uh, Lay's chips, right? Or like these really sugary jams, these are really processed and they have tons and tons and tons of calories. They have lots of energy, but they're nutrients and they're completely bankrupt in nutrients, right? And the next thing are processed foods. Um, so obviously in the last hundred years, if we're going to stipulate that time frame, there's been a really marked increase in the consumption of processed, but also ultra processed foods. These are high in refined sugars. These are high in unhealthy fats. These are high in additives for which we haven't really well understood their metabolic effects. And again, they have very low nutritional value. And um, we've seen time and again that they contribute to various metabolic disorders. Now, there are also ch really drastic changes in our macronutrient intake. There are two things that have become completely runaway processes, and we don't check them in our minds. But first of all, high carbohydrate intake. Lots of diets throughout the world have become incredibly refined. Um, carbohydrates and sugars, uh, you know, increasingly represent the majority of these people's intake. This is the number one predictor um, to increase insulin resistance. Um, and in population level uh, studies, epidemiological studies, we see is associated with a higher prevalence of metabolic syndrome. But the next thing is, and this is kind of like a double knockout, is the low fiber intake. We used to have 100 years ago, very, very high fiber intake. But now we have a a reduced consumption of whole grains, reduced consumption of fruits, reduced consumption of vegetables. Um, and these, of course, this lower dietary fiber intake, these affect everything from the gut to metabolic processes. And so if you are going to impact the gut by depriving it of its normal food sources, what we get are these really um, diseased internal bioreactors. That's what the gut microbiome is. And this affects everything from our development, neuronal development, fetal development, um, the onset of cancers, um, and, and even immune responses. Um, and, then, and then the next thing I would say is, like, what about like our sedentary changes? I mentioned we don't change, we don't chase the food supply anymore. The food supply chases us. So we are basically sitting down with increased screen time, um, automated transportation. These are very low at physical activity levels. Um, and because of this, we, we reduce our energy expenditure. And this, again, is, is, is just gasoline on the fire for weight gain and metabolic disease. And then there's like urbanization and occupational changes. We don't really realize how everything from this you know, unnatural light in our, in our rooms, in our, in our offices, in our workplaces is affecting our circadian rhythms, which ultimately have drastic metabolic effects downstream. And then also you have these um, urban living environments, which are again, very sedentary, right? If I want something, if I'm in a, if I'm in a city, I can really just go down or door dash it or, or you know, it, everything is sort of conducive to limiting um, uh, uh, exercise and promoting the consumption of calorie dense foods. And then also there's these environmental factors. We live in a world where our leaders do not care if we are existing in like this you know, completely polluted, decimated, apocalyptic environmental sphere. And, and it doesn't have to get as bad as the movies for us to realize those effects. We are, um, you know, constantly um, interacting with, you know, BPA, phthalates, uh, pesticides. These are all endocrine disruptors. Um, they all impact metabolism greatly. Um, and, and these endocrine disruptors, you know, things like, you know, glyphosate, they've been linked to 
obesity, insulin resistance, um, uh, metabolic disorder. That's what I was just going to ask about because there's, um, I was trying to look him up. He's a PhD, a friend of Alex Hermosi, who's somebody I follow on Instagram. And I, at any rate, he talks about weight loss is all about calorie in and calorie out, right? And it's like, yeah, but what are we looking at in regards to the metabolism and the function of that or the gut and the function of that? And that's where those micronutrients come into play. Could you perhaps unpack your perspective of calorie in, calorie out? how it pertains to weight loss and then also the micronutrients and how those might pertain to it? Yeah, so in grad school, we did this very interesting exercise where we tried to trace the provenance of where does this 3,500 calories equals a pound come from? And it, it came from these really like totally misconstrued and poorly conducted metabolic chamber studies. It was It's basically like the average of like three animal studies and this really terrible human study that had like four participants. Um, and for these four, they were all healthy, sort of um, 18 to 35 year old um, white men. And they looked at them and they were like, this is 3,500, this is how much they're sweating, this is how much they're getting out. And we calculate that a pound of, of you know, weight loss is associated with the expenditure of this much. There's you know, a lot of research based on that concept, isn't there? No, no. In fact, no? if you look at what that's just does, well, yes. then why does that stick? Because we like it. Human minds love heuristics. Human minds love a simple rule of thumb. On average, you know, sort of these things. Some things can be taken on average. Some things require a very individualized approach that appreciates the nuances that are probably more important in that construct. When we talk about weight loss, we are, for instance, calories are great. Calories are great, right? You can you can do the 3,500 calories on a person who has high glyphosate exposure, high mercury toxicity, and see if they lose weight. Starve them. Give them only water. You will see that, in fact, they either do not lose nearly as much as you thought they would, calculated they would on paper, nor do, uh, in some instances, do they even gain weight. They, they retain water when um, their gut motility goes down. So this is not true for everybody. And it's very important that you understand the context of a person's, you know, biopsychosocial sphere before you make a sort of an intervention. That's why we always insist that we cannot do our digital twinning experiments without our Omni survey, which takes a, a large slice of information from the biological, the psychological, and this individual sociological sphere, which is always important when we're up in interpreting biological data. And so um, yeah, it's it's not true. The data is totally misconstrued. It comes from studies that are inherently flawed. When we have tried to repeat this uh, in various studies, we have seen drastic changes and that it, it's confirmed that 3,500 calories is not equal a pound. In some individuals, right, who have experienced a, a phenomenon in weight loss known as adaptive thermogenesis. If you've ever been losing weight and suddenly you plateau, you are experiencing adaptive thermogenesis where your basal metabolic rate goes way down and your body starts to use less um, metabolite or less energy because it thinks it's starving. In those individuals, it's 5,000 calories equals a pound. That's why weight loss gets harder. In individuals that have you know, a very high proportion of fast twitch fibers, they're metabolically active, um, they are going to burn a lot more. It's How do you not... burst through the plateau then? How do you burst through the plateau? You maintain it. And then um, a lot of times what you can do is supply your mitochondria with certain things like MCT oil, um, increased hydration, and then actually slowly introducing a more food in to a certain level. So you're not going back up to your previous free feeding levels, but you're adding in a little bit more food. You're basically telling your body, no, we're not starving. We're not dying. Here's some more food. The body starts to burn more energy and then you cut it off again and then you plateau again and you do the same thing. You slowly bring it up and then you cut it off again. Um, this is is how you sort of overcome the successive humps of adaptive thermogenesis. And how would your Therium test and the personalized protocols produced for that potentially assist somebody in that plateau of weight loss? Yeah, so when individuals come to us and they say, I have... You know, this height, this weight, we of course calculate BMI when we contextually make it relevant with their age, um, which a lot of people don't do. They don't understand why that's important. Um, but we see the BMI and then if they express, you know, certain weight loss issues or if they express a desire to lose more weight, we will 
analyze those thermogenic metabolites that are associated with the processes of adaptive thermogenesis. We'll look at a lot of the short chain fatty acids, sorry, not the short chain fatty acids, but the um, uh, uh, medium chain fatty acids that are related with um, beta oxidation of uh, the mitochondria. We'll also look at endocrine functioning metabolites and we will assess their levels and we'll see, okay, how much are they consuming from their food intake questionnaire? And then we will essentially recommend some dietary changes that may increase their nutritional and caloric intake concomitantly together for a certain period of time, and then we'll cut it back off. Or we might even recommend that they go into an acute ketogenic diet for about four to six weeks, roughly. Um, and then that individual um, will start to burn more fats and they will, without increasing their caloric intake, also be able to get over that thermogenic hump. There are actually multiple strategies and it's based upon the individual's metabolism and what um, our model, as it maps that to you know the cake pathways, um, what our model sees and what aberrations is trying to address. Um, and it's largely informed by the patient's self-report data, as well as their self-reported intentions with taking the test and what their own goals are um, at the time. I mean, uh, honestly, we've had very, very good success in this, um, in the literature, um, doing these things. We we have many clinical trials looking at, you know, everything from uh, an increased exercise regimen to, um, you know, vinegar intake for, um you know, a reduction of visceral adiposity. We have lots of strategies in our toolbox, both things that we've worked on personally and published and things, of course, that need to be borrowed from the literature and mined from there. So what so does the are, vinegar are, intake do? So vinegar intake, what we postulate it does is it creates um, this short chain fatty acid. It, it, you need to take it pre So you need to take it before your meals and this um, short chain fatty acids are, are produced specifically one of, known as butyrate and with this increased butyrate production um, we believe that lots of the um, glucose and fats are shuttled um, away from the cells and they are uh, put in as waste products um, because of this conjugation to butyrate um, does so that, that hinder nutrient uptake too no, it seems no. It, it it doesn't seem to hinder uh, nutrient uptake. In fact, it helps with things also like depression. So, like when we retest these individuals after eight weeks, we see that they have um, um, uh, 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 decreases in their Beck depression inventory scores. Um, we we also see that there are uh, general micronutrient panels that we'll take of them. So, looking at you know vitamin D, vitamin B twelve, um, all of these really important compounds, and they are. Um, at comparable levels pre-baseline. We, we are not trying to change their diet, so we're not expecting that their micronutrients go up, but we shouldn't see significant decline from baseline if their diet is being kept relatively the same um, at, at those baseline levels at the, at the at retest. So that is, that is one way where we can kind of say, well, it's not just taking away nutrients either. Um, we are seeing that they have decreased blood glucose we do see that they have decreased markers of lipid metabolism. So there is this postulated effect that is you can produce this butyrate in the gut before you consume the meal, then that butyrate will essentially bind and transport selectively um, glucose um, molecules as they are uh, digested from carbohydrates um, and uh, these fatty acids, which if left unchecked, you know, and, and you absorb more than, than you really need to, that glucose is going to be packaged as glycogen. That glycogen um, can be, you know, stored as, as fat across the liver and other um, viscera. And that fat on the viscera is really the most detrimental. That is really the most harmful. That's what I have the most of. But it is it is something that you should always work to curb. Yeah, we haven't even talked about antibiotic use. Like antibiotic use is like through the fucking roof, right? And so we have like been killing these things that produce these other things we need to like live and survive. And without the microbiome, we, we really can't do that. Um, it is like nuts, dude. Like it, it blows my mind how easily antibiotics are prescribed for like say ear infections or pink eye like we have some neighbors no shade on them like you know they, they but they go to the physician every time there is like a slight ear infection a slight eye infection um something that is pretty like mundane and not really causing a, a 
problem because it's going to resolve itself. But then the doctor yeah. is like, well, you're here. I have to give you antibiotics. Now, here you go. Take the antibiotics. And these girls are sick all the time. All the Their time. microbiome is yeah. destroyed. They're, yeah. they're like, it's, it's, it's nuts how much we're just like, yeah, nuke it. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> let's go. Yeah. 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 Whereas, whereas, you know, maybe a hydrogen peroxide rinse of the ear, you know, might be, you know, some diluted hydrogen peroxide with a Q-tip might be. A, yeah. A if it doesn't self-resolve, that is. If it doesn't self-resolve. Exactly. And so I, I, I really shudder at how much antibiotic use has gone through the roof, how underappreciated those effects are in the last hundred. So we have to understand that these longer lifespans have brought about higher incidence of chronic diseases, including these metabolic disorders. Um, and so, you know, I don't know, there's a bunch of other things that I really don't really like that are out there, like statins, um, antihypertensive medications. These, these is ridiculous. First of all, it's like war on cholesterol is like totally ridiculous. Cholesterol has many good benefits. Cholesterol is one of the most um, evolutionarily important and adaptive molecules to us, especially when we talk about handling um, high oxygenation when we evolved from the seas to land. Um, cholesterol. But yeah, they're benefits. not the root cause. They're just there to take care of what's going on. Ab absolutely. So statins, um, you know, have really detrimental metabolic effects. Antihypertensives have very detrimental metabolic effects. We use them, you know, like they're sort of PES dispensers. Um, uh, but again, uh, they, they, they usually lead to things like weight gain. They usually lead to things like insulin. You know, when I see people who, you know, are like, for instance, on a Zempic, you know, I'm, I'm like, we, listen, GLP-1 um, an agonism has lots of benefits. Um, it, it even has is like benefits for like substance use disorders, right? Like it has a lot of cool things. We just don't know, you know, what it really does yet. So I feel like if you are using it for something like substance use disorder, maybe it's a good use case because it's, its safety has been proven more so than intravenous drug use. But if you are trying to lose weight and be metabolically healthy, there are natural, albeit slower and harder ways to get the same thing. But at the end of it, you are not exposing yourself to the pharmaceutical actions of this drug um, that is affecting this protein and this, this, this you know, uh, GLP-1, this glucagon-like peptide. And we don't know everything that happens downstream of that. After it activates that, we have a few things we know it does, and there's a bunch of things that we know it does that we still can't figure out because it or, or what's affected. So why would you choose in the instance of, oh, I just want to lose a few pounds? Why would you choose, you know, an ozempic or semaglutide over, I'm just going to diet and exercise? Um, and make sure that I'm consuming an adequate amount of nutritious food and being metabolically active, activating those pathways affected by exercise and, and eat, you know, clean food and drink, you know, clean water and breathe clean air. That is, is going to be um, always, I think, the gold standard and all these other sort of shortcuts that we like to take. This is, this is the reason why I think we'll never flip the switch um, it's happening in some cases. I think, you know, newer cities that are being developed are being developed with an eye toward like walkability, um, if it's possible. Uh, I know that, you know, my generation is, is moving toward, um, you know, drinking less alcohol. The new generation is, is really into mocktails. They're, they're, they're not drinking at all. Um, it's very forward thinking these days to abstain from alcohol. Um, it, some, some changes are happening at the micro scale, whether or not they endure and eventually hit mainstream, uh, is yet to be seen. But I think a lot of people are just going to want, you know, their football and, and, you know, potato chips and, 